Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art, and uh, I wanted to apologize for being gone for four days and not reading anything. I've been inundated with work and helping Kevin up the coast and figuring all that stuff out. And um, so here I am after a full day of work. It's 11.30 or 11.25, but I'm determined to get this read. So I'm going to read a little bit. I probably won't read very long. As you can tell, I'm not quite feeling good. I feel a little run down, so I'm drinking some Chinese yik tea that my friend who's an acupuncturist gave me. Uh, it definitely tastes gross. It's actually, what is that? It's that propolis. It's propolis and honey, and it's just hot water. According to him, and it did make me well when I was sick, so I thought I'd try it again. But uh, anybody who knows me knows me that tomorrow's probably going to be a morning pee day, meaning I'm going to drink about this much of my morning pee in the morning when I first wake up, and by noon I'll feel, feel a lot better. And it's called uh, urine therapy, and I've done it for years. And it actually works. I'll put a link to the scientific information from Vanderbilt University so that people who haven't heard of this, who thinks it's disgusting, will see the benefits of it. It does work. It's an ancient technology that our bodies know how to build the perfect antibiotics bodies. So I don't know why it works so well, and I always use it as the last resort. <laughs> There's something about drinking your own pee that's a bit disgusting, but it does work when you're sick. So I'm going to move on with our little chapter here that we're at, the little sub-chapter. And here we go with my ever-famous double glasses. Okay, then. And this is called, the subtitle is called, Reactor Releases Would Contaminate Food. And I've actually read this. I kept trying to read it, and I thought it was horrible, so I didn't want to make you guys suffer. So hopefully this time around I'll have made a bit of progress. <laughs> Uh, but I did read it two days ago, so, boop, might have left my head. Okay, the NPCs, uh, this is, I, I apologize, I'll read backwards. We're on page 148 in our little book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Arthur Tamplin and John Goffman. We're on Chapter 7, Nuclear Reactors. At the bottom of page 148, reactor, replaces, reactor releases would contaminate food. Mm-hmm. The NPCs, which is, again, if you remember, maximum permissible concentrations. The NPCs that are tabulated in Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations apply only to the situation where individuals are breathing the contaminated air or drinking the contaminated water. They do not take into account the fact that contaminated air and the contaminated water will result in the contamination of foods consumed by men. This is an extremely important factor in terms of the dosage that would be received by man from nuclear releases. For example, if the cesium-137 concentration in water were at the maximum permissible concentration, MPC, allowed by the AEC, an individual could not eat even one pound of fish a year without exceeding the present radiation exposure guidelines. So, wow, so they raised that up like, what, 10,000-fold, okay. The reason that this is, the reason for this is that the cesium concentration in the fish will be a thousand times, will be a thousand times higher than the cesium concentrations in the water. If the cesium-137 concentration in the air were maintained for just one day at the concentration allowed by the AEC, a child drinking one liter of milk per day from cows on pasture would receive a dosage of 7 rad. This is 40 times higher than the present exposure guideline for one year. Remember, this is for air concentration at MPC for only one day, not day after day. The same kind of calculation indicates that most of the MPCs are far too high. Wow. Tamplin presented this kind of information at the Minnesota Symposium. He also indicated that the guideline dosage for exposure to the population was inappropriately too high and that no one should consider exposing the population to anything close to the guideline dosage. Wow. The proponents of the nuclear power industry at this meeting, noticeably the horrible traitor, 
Dr. Meryl Eisenbud, Professor of Environmental Medicine, New York University Medical Center. No fucking wonder our environment is fucking falling apart with bastards like this at the helm. The proponents of the nuclear power industry at this meeting, noticeably the evil Dr. Merrill Eisenbud, again, tended to indicate that exposure at the guideline levels of radiation were not really significant. They also indicated that the exposure from nuclear power plants would be considerably lower than those of the guidelines. They indicated that individuals in the near vicinity of nuclear reactors would be exposed to no more than 5 to 10 millirams a year, and that as individuals lived further and further away from the reactor, their exposure would drop off rapidly from this 5 to 10 milliram per year value. Moreover, they, they indicated that the design objectives and the operation of existing power plants demonstrated that the... I'm sorry, I'm going to read that again. Moreover, they indicated that the design objectives and the operation of existing power plants demonstrated that the actual releases of radioactivity from power plants were no more than 1% of the releases allowed by the AEC MPC values. The message then is that they presented to the individuals attending the symposium. The message then that they presented to the individuals attending the symposium was that nuclear reactors would release radionuclides from the reactors at level below those proposed by the state of Minnesota, which were 50-fold more restrictive than those of the AEC. See, folks, it's not going to kill you. Come on, believe us, we're scientists. Consequently, the individuals attending the meeting repeatedly asked the question, if reactors are only going to release the small amount of radioactivity you indicate, then why are you so reluctant to make the guidelines more restrictive and adopt the Minnesota regulations? This question was never really answered. Congressman Hosmer did state that if the standards were lowered, he doubted if the reactors could operate safely. AEC Commissioner Thompson made essentially the same statement in testifying before the Atomic the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. And there, I, I forgot to tell you is this, but there's references. This book has tons of references. So this is reference number 45. In other words, the Joint Committee and the AEC state that the reactors will release radioactivity far below the guidelines. And if you lower the guidelines, they will not be able to operate safely. Wow. Let's read that again. In other words, the Joint Committee and the AEC state that the reactors will release radioactivity far below the guidelines. But if you lower the guidelines, they will not be able to operate safely. They seem to want to have their cake and eat it too. This is totally inconsistent. So they're willing to poison people so that radioactivity can keep going. What is the real reason? That's the new subtitle. If the reactors are to release less than one one hundredth of the present allowable release rates, then why should the AEC and the Joint Committee be so reluctant to lower the standards by a factor of 50? The only conclusion that a reasonable person can come to is that the AEC and Joint Committee do not believe that the reactors will be able to operate at these lower release rates. This becomes all the more confusing when you really realize that the Northern States Power Company, which is most intimately concerned with the Monticello reactor in Minnesota, has indicated that would, it would be willing to comply with the state of Minnesota standards. To remove some of the confusion from this paradox, one then might conclude that the Joint Committee and the AEC are reluctant to lower the guidelines because this would not leave any room for the development of their other pet project, the Plowshare Program. This doesn't make very much sense because it is possible for a set of standards to be developed to apply specifically to the Nuclear Reactor Program, and the Plowshare Program could then have a set of standards developed to apply directly to it. Accepting this, it must be concluded that the AEC and the Joint Committee do not have confidence that the nuclear reactor program will be able to operate when regulated by more restrictive standards. 
They must feel that these more restrictive standards will force their nuclear reactor industry out of business. No shit, Sherlock. There are other aspects of the problem which were never really discussed at the Minnesota Symposium that may give the AEC some cause for worry over more restrictive release rates on present-day reactors. These other aspects of the problem are the fuel reprocessing plants and the disposal of radioactive waste. The fuel reprocessing and waste disposal aspects of the nuclear industry will be discussed in a subsequent chapter of this book. It suffices to say here that discussing the release rates from a successfully operating present-day nuclear reactor is only, is only discussing a portion of the problem, that the major aspects of the problem reside in those subjects that were not really covered at the University of Minnesota Symposium. Another aspect of nu nuclear reactor was that largely glossed over, I'm sorry, Another aspect of the of nuclear reactors that was largely glossed over at this symposium was the consequences of an accident. With respect to accidents, both minor and major, one important aspect of the nuclear power industry was brought out quite vividly by Harold Green, a law professor from George Washington University. This was the requirement that the nuclear industry oh here we go. This was the requirement of the nuclear industry for the Price-Anderson Act. Fuck me. I hate this guy. I hate those people that created that law. Okay, new subtitle. Price-Anderson Act limits liability. The Price-Anderson Act is a unique piece of legislation. It limits the liability of a nuclear power reactor to some $560 million. Period. No matter how much damage. That's my comment. This dollar limit is quite a concession since a study conducted by the AEC's Brookhaven National Laboratory indicated that an accident of a nuclear reactor could result in a total liability of some $7 billion. And actually we know it's more than that because what's Fukushima? Trillions of dollars. In other words... The Congress of the United States has limited the liability of these nuclear reactors in such a way that should a serious accident occur, the public would get back only seven cents on the dollar of the damage that was done. This is where I start cussing, you guys. Moreover, of this $560 million limit in liability, the private insurance carriers have underwritten less than $100 million. The U.S. government stands behind the rest of the liability. It would seem that at the marketplace, where you have to put your money where your mouth is, the insurance underwriters have decided they do not have sufficient confidence in this fledgling industry to try to even under, to even try to underwrite the congressional limit of five hundred and sixty million dollars in liability. A very important question arises from this consideration: Would there be a nuclear power industry in this country if it were not for the Price-Anderson Act? Hell, no. Most of the people feel that the nuclear power industry would not exist if the Price-Anderson Act did not coexist with it. If the act did not exist, the government would probably be developing this reactor technology in remote parts of the country, and the industry would be waiting to develop only when proven safety was established. Another important point which Professor Green brought out at the Minnesota Symposium was the cost to interveners in reactor hearings. He estimated that at a bare bones minimum, it would cost the individual members of the public some $100,000 to fight a successful intervention against a proposed reactor. Imagine that in today's dollars, you guys. Some math guy can probably figure that one out. Moreover, he pointed out a number of inequities in the timing schedule for the interveners and their lawyers to file petitions for intervention, intervention and to present their material before the licensing boards. In other words, 
He said that the reactor siting and licensing procedure was so organized that would, it would be almost impossible for those who opposed it to intervene successfully. Mission accomplished. We've seen that happen since 1970. In fact, we're seeing it right now with the wind project. They're popping up all these little tiny little nuclear reactors all over the fucking place. As a result of the symposium at the, Minis at the University of Minnesota, our apprehension concerning the safety of nuclear power reactors was increased. The reluctance of the AEC and the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy to make the standards relating to reactor releases more restrictive was a paradox since the AEC and members of the reactor industry stated that the releases would be very low. Moreover, the existence of the Price-Anderson Act and the reluctance of the insurance company to underwrite even the limited liability which was set by Congress posed questions concerning the true safety of nuclear reactors. Finally, the discussion of Professor Green concerning the difficulty in intervening in reactor siting and licensing procedures indicated that a nuclear juggernaut was moving across the land. If the nuclear industry, the AEC and the JCAE were overstating the safety of nuclear power reactors, the situation looked grave indeed. We therefore began to look into the literature concerning the safety and the operational aspects of the nuclear power reactors. By the time of the AAAS symposium arrived on December 28, 1969, our review of the more general information concerning reactor safety had led us to the conclusion that the people of the United States were being subjected to a gigantic experiment. Exactly, where they're fucking lab rats. The unpredictable outcome of this experiment could be a severe tragedy occurring in some major metropolitan area. Hello, New York and Los Angeles, San Diego, Northern California. Consequently, the talk which Tamplin prepared for, consequently, the talk which Tamplin prepared for presentation at the AAAS meeting called for a moratorium on the construction of new nuclear power facilities until the uncertainties concerning the safety of nuclear power could be resolved. New subtitle, Tamplin's moratorium su suggestion is censored. Uh. It was this report that was severely censored by Dr. Roger Batzel, Associate Director at the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory for Chemistry in the Biomedical Division. I wonder if that fucking rat is still alive. Dr. Roger Batzel. In effect, Tamplin was informed that unless he removed the suggestion of a moratorium from that report, the laboratory would not fund his travel to the AAAS meeting. In fact... It would not allow him to prepare or have the report typed using the facilities of the laboratory. Dr. Batzel indicated that this kind of statement on the part of Tamplin represented irresponsibility. So I guess Tamplin fucking backed down? That's bullshit. He should have paid for his own fucking ticket and told those people to go fuck themselves. Strangely enough, at this particular time, there was such a bill recommending a moratorium introduced into the U.S. House of Representatives by Congressman Lester L. Wolf of New York. The bill intended to provide a moratorium on the construction of new nuclear re power reactors for a period of 10 years. Reluctantly, Tamplin removed that portion of the discussion from his paper for the AAAS meeting and at the AAAS symposium presented only the data related to the erroneous nature of the maximum permissible concentrations and the inappropriately high Federal Radiation Council guidelines for exposure of the population. So he fucking backed down. Arthur Tamplin fucking stabbed us in the back because he wanted them to type his paperwork and pay for his fucking ticket and he didn't want to get ridiculed. That's bullshit in my book. We shall now present the full story as we saw it then with some additional information which has come to our attention subsequent to that period of time. But before we go into the discussion of the nature of nuclear reactors, it is important to point out that one of the subjects discussed at the AAAS symposium was fossil fuel plants. 
The nature of the discuss discussion concerning fossil fuel plants was that although today they belch noxious gas from their chimneys, it is totally within the ability of the existing science and technology to clean up these emissions dramatically. The development of the technology has been hampered considerably because of the lack of funding for the necessary research and development. I wonder why those greedy bastards, they have all the money there is. One of the reasons why this money may not have been available for the development of this technology was that some $400 million per year was pumped into the development of the nuclear reactor technology. The essence of the comments from the people discussing the fossil fuel plants was that we could have clean fossil fuel plants today. These statements were highlighted in a talk by Carl E. Baggy, Vice President of the Federal Power Commission, and I quote, The research and development effort for atomic energy received over 84% of all the federal funds for energy uh, research and development. R&D, that's how they wrote it, R&D. It has also received approximately it has also received approximately three billion dollars of government expenditures in the last twenty years. Compared with this ambitious federal commitment to atomic energy, the amounts of money which have been and are allocated for the improvement of fossil fuel generation and for other fossil fuel energy re research are ridiculously small. True that still is today. Hold on. Moreover, the University of Minnesota Symposium, I beg your pardon, moreover, at the University of, U uh, one more time, huh? Moreover, at the University of Minnesota Symposium, Dr. M. King Hubert of the Department of Interior indicated, for example, that we have about a 200-year supply of coal in this country alone, in addition to our oil reserves. In other words, there is no real need to, to a rush headlong into the rapid proliferation of nuclear power reactors, because we have the potential for clean fossil fuel plants as a reasonable alternative to potentially unsafe nuclear power plants. We can wait for proven safety, but as Power Commissioner Baggy and others have pointed out, fossil fuels will represent the backbone of our electrical power generation for a number of years to come. We should expend every effort to make fossil fuel plants as clean as possible, which they didn't do that either, by the way. What is wrong with nuclear power plants? Oh my gosh, I'm at 22 minutes. I think I will stop there. We're on page 155, new subtitle. What is wrong with nuclear power plants? So uh, I'll talk to you guys tomorrow, and I hope I feel better by tomorrow night, but I'm still going to read a little bit. I think I can, as you can see, the new digs, I brought this in my office so that uh, I hired somebody to help me. So this is the new venue. So I'll see you tomorrow. Put your courage feet on, and uh, like they said, $100,000, is that what they said, to try to stop? Like, we're up against Goliath. This is David and Goliath. Like, seriously, these motherfuckers. So I'm going to keep on and doing what I can to let people know about the lies that our government has perpetrated on this and used us like fucking lab rats. And it has to stop. We have to call our elected officials and say, look, you guys have got to stop this insanity. The nuclear power industry is literally killing us, and there's no proof that it's safe. When you gurgle out what they say, it's not true. It's not true what they're telling you. And we have to tell that to our elected officials, like Ron Wyden, you know, Inhofe. Fuck, Inhofe. I don't know who's out in Oklahoma, but somebody out there needs to be his constituent and call that guy and say, uh, nuclear. Mitch McConnell, Kentucky, filling up Kentucky with nuclear power. So it's up to us to call and poke these guys, not let them just fucking steamroller over us. So I know it's a little bit of a risk, but guess what? They don't give a crap about us that much. As this book just said, they're going to steamroll. But we can't just like let them do it without fucking giving them a hard-ass time. I'm not going to let them steal my grandchildren's lives without trying to make an effort. I, I actually visualize a time when nuclear energy is ended. 
fossil fuels are ended and we have power and we have solar and we are learning to live in an entirely different way because everything is no, not here anymore. Many of us have these visions and I think it's real. So anyways, blah, blah. Ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on, eh?